My name is Lisa Fuller. I work for an organization called Nonviolent Peace Force. Nonviolent Peace Force is an international non-governmental organization that works to prevent violence and protect civilians in areas affected by conflict. I've worked for Nonviolent Peace Force for four years, including recently as a field team leader in South Sudan. In this work, my field team had particular success in reducing the level of violence in one of the most highly affected areas of South Sudan. In particular, we reduced the level of violence in a particular area from about 150 incidences a month to zero. The purpose of this presentation is to share with you the strategies and the techniques that we used in hopes that the lessons that we learned can be applied to help prevent civilians from suffering in other areas and instances of violent conflict. So, first to explain the methodology that is used by Nonviolent Peace Force. We use what we call unarmed civilian peacekeeping to protect civilians. And it can be seen as a toolbox of different strategies and tools that are used depending on the context to make civilians safer. The first strategy that was developed and originally used is what we call proactive presence. Proactive presence is the strategy of physically being present near civilians who are under threat as outsiders in order to deter the violence. So for example, in Sri Lanka, our first field project, we would put internationals in communities that were under threat of being attacked. Because we were outsiders and potential perpetrators did not want any witnesses to the violence, they would usually wouldn't commit violence if we were present. To give you an analogy of why this is effective, you can think about domestic violence. Domestic violence almost always occurs in the home. It doesn't usually happen in shopping malls. The reason why is that people do not want witnesses when they commit acts that can be perceived as bad. Not only do they not want legal consequences, but they also don't want their peers to think that they're bad people. By being present in these communities that were vulnerable, we were essentially bringing them out of the home and into the shopping mall. From that strategy, we were able to develop other ways that we could more effectively make civilians safer. Now, in every society, there are certain actors that are really responsible for keeping the civilians safe. These are usually the government, the police, and the military, and depending on the particular context, there can be other actors like UN peacekeepers. So one of the ways that we work is to try and help these different institutions be more effective and have more motivation to do their jobs in protecting civilians. We also work to train local civil society organizations on how to more effectively protect themselves. We do this through trainings, through um, security analysis of different buildings or areas where they're vulnerable, and by making community protection teams and linking them with different security actors so that they can use these relationships to make themselves safer. Unarmed civilian peacekeeping is both proactive and reactive. It's proactive in the sense that we go into societies and situations where violence is expected to happen and try to prevent that violence from happening before it starts. It's also reactive in that we go to, into situations where violence is already occurring because violence is usually a cycle. One act of violence leads to another act of violence leads to more revenge. By interrupting the cycle of violence, we can prevent future suffering. So with that in mind, let's talk about South Sudan. To give you some background, South Sudan is the world's newest country. It gained independence in 2011 after 50 years of civil war with Sudan. Most of the population was elated that they had finally gotten this long sought autonomy. However, it became quickly apparent that internal divisions were going to be one of the biggest challenges for the new country. South Sudan has 64 tribes that have 64 cultures and 64 different languages. And once they were not united by a common enemy, they began to fight each other. The area where I worked in had a particularly high level of civil military violence. When we established a field site in this location, we saw that women were being raped or sexually assaulted every day, men were being beaten every day, and the civilians were also killed on a frequent basis. From there, we built relationships 
with all of the different areas that were involved in the conflict. So this includes the community, all of the security actors, and the perpetrators or potential perpetrators. So in this particular example, security actors meant the police, the military, government officials, tribal or traditional leaders, UN peacekeepers, and UNPOL, which are UN police advisors. We identified the area in the town we were based in that had the highest level of violence. This was important because we only had a 10-member team, and so it was important to prioritize which areas where we could really make a difference. After we identified this area, and we established a relationship with the local leader, we developed strategies on how to prevent more violence from happening. But first, we organized the different security actors. We got them all together, and we took them on a tour of this particular area so that they would better understand what the situation was and where civilians were most vulnerable. After they were aware of the situation, we then um, asked them to participate in three particular strategies that we used to protect the civilians. The first strategy were patrols, which were used as a form of protective presence. All of the violence in this area, for various reasons, occurred between 11 a.m. and 8 p.m. each day. This meant that there were nine hours in which civilians were vulnerable. So each day, we organized three patrols. One patrol would be conducted by UN peacekeepers. Another patrol was conducted by the police and UNPOL jointly. And we, as NP, would conduct a third patrol. Each patrol would last for two hours, and each patrol would change the, at a different time each day. This meant that for six of the nine hours where civilians were vulnerable, there was protective presence in the area. The potential perpetrators didn't know what times the, the patrols would happen, but they knew that the chances were someone would be there if they tried to commit an act of violence. We also identified two areas where women were particularly vulnerable. The first area was the water point, because in South Sudan, only women pump water. And the second area was a woman's farm, where about 100 women had gotten together and decided that they would create a farm and plant crops to increase their own food security, so that they wouldn't have to rely on food aid. However, once they started planting these crops, the potential perpetrators noticed that there were a lot of women who were alone here, and they began harassing them. As a result, the women began running away, and they weren't able to properly attend to their crops. So the UN peacekeepers, as well as ourselves, began spending extra time in this area. The women then felt safe. They no longer had to run away. And you can physically see that how this type of work affected the farm. And the areas where crops were planted, when the women were being harassed, the crops are uneven, and they're unhealthy because the women couldn't properly tend to them. The crops that were planted after we began providing protective presence are both healthy and even. As I said, the water point was the other area where they were vulnerable. So we also began providing extra protective presence here, and the UN peacekeepers did as well. However, we did encounter one problem when we started this. When we came to observe the UN peacekeepers, we noticed that they had decided to take this opportunity to pump water for themselves. While that was all nice and well for them, it meant that the women had to stand in line for a much longer period of time. We spoke to the commander of the peacekeepers, and we asked if perhaps the peacekeepers would be willing to pump water for the women. They agreed to do this, and they began doing it, and it was something that the women loved because this was the first time that men had ever pumped water for them. While that is sometimes a funny story of success, it's important in the sense that it helped build trust between the UN peacekeepers and the local women who previously did not have a particularly trusting relationship. The second strategy that we used was what we called a security phone tree. So sometimes when violence would occur, civilians would call the police but unfortunately, this was a situation where the police didn't really have the power to protect civilians. If they responded, they too could be attacked, and thus they often wouldn't respond at all. The security phone tree ensured that security actors would respond to support the police and ensure that they were effective in protecting civilians. So specifically, 
The community was divided into 10 separate sections. Each small section with about 40 to 50 people was monitored by one section leader. The section leader knew that if he or she observed any signs or threats of violence that he should call the local leader. The local leader would then access us, give us a call, and we would be able to call the different security actors that could respond, as well as the police, to ensure that there was an immediate response that did keep civilians safe. The third strategy we used is what we call community security meetings. Every two weeks, we would organize a meeting where community members would come and all of the different security actors would also send a representative. This gave the community an opportunity to update the security actors on their particular security situation at the time, and the security actors could talk about the different ways they could adapt strategies to better fit the context. Now, we did encounter a problem in that at the first two security meetings, only a very few women came, and those women that did come didn't feel comfortable to speak. Because we thought it was so important that women's perspective was included, we talked to the woman leader and we decided to organize a separate women's security meeting. Contrary to the other security meetings, the woman leader told us that she would take care of all of the arrangements. She just told us what time and what place to show up. When we came, we saw that almost every single woman from the community had come, and that was much more than the number of men that had come to the security meetings previously. And that meeting was a particular success. The women said this was the first time that they'd ever even talked with each other about their own security. The security actors said this was the first time that they'd ever talked to women about their security. And that they found talking to women particularly vital because the women seemed to have more information about the security situation. The reason for this was that women tended to stay at home during the day while their husbands would go off and work. And thus men had less information about the threats that were affecting their family. The question then is, was implementing these three strategies effective? So as I said, there were about 150 incidents of violence based on police reports in the town before, um, before we began implementing these strategies. The vast majority of these instances occurred in the area that we had targeted. Now, oftentimes violence is not reported, so probably the instances of violence was actually much higher. Once again, came to the police after we began implementing these strategies to see the number of police reports. They reported for the entire town, they had 26 reports of violence, and none of these reports were in the area that we had worked in. Of course, it's also important to get information from the community. We can't reply, rely on these police reports alone. The community told us repeatedly at the security meetings that violence had been eliminated both sexual violence, beatings, and shootings. Of course, just to make sure that this was true, that people felt comfortable talking about what was really going on um, in uh, an individual and private circumstance, while we were doing patrols, we would talk to different families, we would talk to children, we would talk to men, we would talk to women, and we would ask them about the level of violence or any threats they were experiencing. And consistently, every single person we talked to told us that all of the violence had disappeared. Just to give you a couple of quotes of the way that the community members expressed, uh, expressed the change. One woman told us that before, she, before we began working in the community, she was even afraid to leave her house. After NP began working there, she even felt safe to go outside and bathe at midnight. Another woman told us that after the patrols began, the perpetrators just began walking by them and they would leave them alone. The other indicator that showed our success was that the UN realized that their peacekeepers too had become so much more effective in this area that they sent a delegation to study what we had done so that they could replicate it in other areas. However, I think it is important to note that while we were really effective here, that strategies in unarmed civilian peacekeeping never works the same way in two places. Contexts, conflict dynamics, and the people involved are always different and no two situations are alike. Just because one tactic works in one area doesn't mean it'll work in another area. Therefore, before implementing unarmed civilian peacekeeping, it's important to analyze the context 
analyze each person and organization and institution's role in the conflict and how it's affected. It's important to build relationships with all of these different stakeholders. That includes not only the security actors and not only the community, but the perpetrators or potential perpetrators as well, as these are the people that you really have to influence. It is also important to identify who can influence the perpetrators. It's these people that need to be targeted if you are going to deter violations. The other thing that is important to understand is that the people that work at NP, that conduct unarmed civilian peacekeeping, are trained extensively. And that without this professional training, it can be dangerous to try and carry out this work. It can not only endanger the people trying to carry out the work, but the community itself. Nonviolent Peace Force trains not only its own staff, but also civil society organizations on how to conduct this work. What I hope you can take away with this, however, is that while oftentimes we feel hopeless as to what we can do when there's a conflict happening, that there is something we can do. While it takes a long time to resolve a conflict, and it often involves high-level negotiations, every day, while these processes are going on, civilians are suffering. But there is something that we can do in the meantime, while these high-level actors are engaging in having a more sustainable solution. There are different strategies, and there are different options to protect these civilians. And there are more options other than military violence or do nothing. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I hope you found it useful. If you would like more information about Nonviolent Peace Force or about unarmed civilian peacekeeping, you can go to our website, www.nonviolentpeaceforce.org. Thanks.